They call me Ganga. The story of my birth is a glorious myth. I am a dream of Lord Shiva's, rising as a stream. My Tandava, a liquid secret still splurging from his knotted hair. My feminine will released to roam beyond this snowy lair. While the destroyer sleeps, his latent power leaps into my cascades, bidding me go forth and multiply. Gushing through decades from the vast north, through flattened plains, down to my bay. What do they call you? On which day were you conceived? My Celtic caves heaved, as Nordic waves received the omen of my birth, even before they set out for my shores, as Thor and Odin would ordain in years to come, they call me the Tay. The truth is I too have a bay, my firth. I have this isthmus of an island to cross. But yours is the earth where I would not be you, a subcontinent spread out for your good or your ill will to brazenly toss in. This too is north, but further north than you. They have laid out their broad hills for me to encircle and run through, spilling over rocky beds under heights so ancient and wise, weathered to gentleness, unlike the heady rise of your stately but youthful fold mountains. Yes, it was there that I awoke to provoke the world to my capricious flow. When I left Shiva's coiled tresses for mortals, I percolated in divers drops of frozen tears in the portals of gigantic caves where my waves vibrated <laughs> and the That too is north, beyond the Garwal hills. The rest is no myth, as I tumble forth in a mighty torrent that rents the sky, rushing down in sheer abandon, having forgotten my frozen, fetal beginnings in the swirling, ice-cold tears of Bhagarati's streaming eyes. Hush, hush, it's now my turn. There's no more rush, for we have courses to run at our own pace. Let this not be a race to be done or won. I too have my watery womb suspended high above sea level to which others roam, paying court at my door, the Philan, the Dochert, and Lochy, who glide to my side, joining me on my way. But I'm not to be won by their supplication. Theirs is only to pay homage to woo me night and day, trying to mingle their kisses and caresses with my tide and shingle, aiming to shine in reflected glory. But I refrain from weakening to flattery. I was born to widen and deepen my hole and reign. I am utterly committed, ignoring my importunate rivals, heeding instead imploring and unfortunate mortals, spreading my bed of old for their good and gain. So have they swarmed to your banks? Have they roamed with your stream? Have they realized dreams in tune with your whims? Were you curved or cradled as you swerved or lingered? Have they come to build homes to rest as your guest for some scores of years on your shores? I, at intervals, Along my hundred and twenty miles of serpentine, riverine progress, they have built their steeples and spires 
as they live and aspire, itinerant souls on my eternal shore. But their numbers are few compared to those who clamber at your door. Aye, that is a word I have heard spoken by your countrymen. I like it, so I will use it to answer your question. Aye. My people come in swarms like summer bees, drawn by promises of warmth and wealth to be gathered with armful ease. But as I have a subcontinent to play in, I have ample time to display my immensity and fame. I cause havoc. I cause pain. I send shocks of lightning rain. I fan out my seething rock, a hooded cobra hissing death. My passions churn in fierce upsurge. I woo fortune and urge brooding heaven to war. For mine is the triple path of heaven, earth, and sea. The icicles of Gamuk could not bind me in Shiva's tangled locks. Riding on Makara, I flashed with chameleon deafness and speed from statuesque anchor to fluid abandon. I plunged in cobalt, white and blue, Splendor in Gauri Kund, that meditative lake overlooked by the ardor of a temple built for me at Gangotri. Like you, I have homage paid by Jadganda and Kushgandra, their drainage and names borrowed from my matrilineal heritage. You are proud, but so am I. With all the ovations and offering, endorsing our very sway over an unresisting landmass, which we erode not with explosion of cannon or dynamite, but with the might of fluid gentleness and tearful coercion. But men can force nature. Your men came to my valleys and found adventure. My sheer paddy green was torn away, and in its place was sown a low caste seed, from which was born this tall, rough stems, which would hide tigers if they could. Only tigers don't prowl here where this hemp grows. You may think my thirst is great, but you haven't seen the worst. My rice beds stood ankle deep, apologetic and shy, their bodies respectably dry in my canal waters, while only their ankles stood lapped over by a million kisses of a multitude of droplets cradled in square fields of translucent green fulfillment. But these new brazen Amazons stand waist deep like shameless women in wet saris, the water cradling their tilting breasts. And doesn't it please you to have erotic images lying in your journey? But these are crops, not rows of women in warm and soft flesh adorning the land I drain. Why? Is that what you would have on your banks? turning from the dry mundane to the blushing hot passion of revealing thighs and bobbing breasts. I too have had my hedges, parted in days of old, when a highland lad and his blue-eyed lass came to my edge to bathe on a soft, dewy spring morning. And voyeuristly, I watched and wore, I laughed them in my arms and fashion love's course, curling round their bodies and tumbling them together 
ensure union. Ah, but those days are gone. You now have laws about bathing, while I have none. To bathe in me is sacred. I wash their sins away and bring earthly bliss. They come with their trust and stand statuesque in the beautiful half-dusk, floating lamps, sprinkling petals, or in the glimmer of that first glow that defies the horizon at dawn, they come to bestow their sorrows in my eternal flow. Clad in their damp folds, they mutter incessant prayers that tremble and ripple my middle course, which sends them back to Gangotri and Bhagarati, knowing they will penetrate the still centre of Shiva's consciousness to awaken and bless them in their deep distress. What is this half-dusk you talk of? It is the time when cows return, raising the dust in a swirl of iridescent vermilion. The Goduli, that moment of semi-secret light when brides elect turn beauty queens for every groom's family to admire and select. Well, I only know the half-light of long summer days when the sun has left unnoticed his brightness, lingering like a hundred footlights suffusing beams, their source invisible to this audience, whose concentrated focus is on the lighted ambience of this dramatic foray marked out with finesse and the magic hours of prolonged daylight with the night squeezed to a bare minimum by what we call twilight. So I am there, visible and outreaching lazily, strolling through warm July days, the silent witness to darkness breaching the wee hours, holy but briefly, rolling back again as brightness reveals my shimmer, the next dawn. <clears throat> Twilight sounds like a dream of light, often imagined, but happening as a longed-for delight, a daydream of sweetness, an infinite light. It's no dream, for the practical fishing and sailing, travel and business, wishing continuity, continuity and completion can find fruition in my water's candid display. In calm September days of Indian summers, to borrow a term, from the shy days of your wintry rays, which best describes 
these balmy days, moving into a meditative autumn. But my days here are more dramatic. Pure gold lines my shores before the blazing disc actually appears. The ochre orange, vermilion red, magenta pink, stroke my sky and spill across my expanse as colours multiply and mix, vying with my upper coarse silver and lower coarse bronze, coppering my willing body with romance. Then I am a woman, the sun, a patriarch no longer dazzled by my beauty, but desiring to command and burn my world to submission, thus weakening my will to brim and overflow. When I am at my lowest point from March till June before those seasonal winds blow my way bringing sustenance and nourishment, the raindrops mingling with my steaming tears of joy uncompounded as my feminine bounty finds fulfillment. Then my coppery bronze surges with teeming masses of clouds congregating in nimbo strata sheets which canopy my horizon. The sky and I revel in a shared camaraderie of abandon amidst thundering applause preceded by lightning's dazzle. And when we are spent, a deep, wandering calm returns, as I find the sequined, velvety mystery of tropical moonlight, when myriad sparkles gleam and glitter like a host of fireflies on my silvery, bangled, dancing arms, that disarm my beholders. My Scots travellers have written those seasonal rains and letters home, the monsoons, those harbingers of festive rain straight from the mighty main, the ponderous breast of the Indian Ocean. My folk have marvelled how you move from one extreme to another show, your parched pain quenched by such rain. It's a dream I seldom see unfold, for I have my weather, variable, uncertain, yet persistent when it's insistent on augmenting my sinuous flow. But you have your seasons, as your poets have told mine. So you have reason to watch and wait for winter snow to melt and divine clusters of crocuses to surface and grow. Reminders of change that ensure the coming of spring to your banks once more. I, I know that days move by as daffodils ripple, once crocuses die, and as one colour fades, others invade. Primroses and daisies, buttercups and pansies, adorning my meadow banks and riverside gardens, till russet and gold repeat the age old story of autumn. Flaming trees to rebellious displays, so different from the nature of my nation, one of shine, embarrassed of revealing passion. And passion is what your men have seen in my brown depths and been afraid of. But remember, my source is an icicle cave, colder than the north of your entire length. And I have an extended responsibility of embracing a subcontinent depending on my ability to drown or drain, relying on a capricious sky to destroy or sustain my millions. Your flooded terrain left alluvium, that loamy compendium of silt and sand in which my countrymen discovered a gold mine of crops for gain. It's the same wanton woman you described earlier, the one who displaced the nourishing loyalty of rice grains on your plains, so your indigenous corpus 
was planted. And from March to May, it grew to a glorious height of 10 to 12 feet in its native domain, its yellow flowers succeeding summer heat ready for the reaping. From July to October, its silky luster gathered in bales of raw jute, keeping ships waiting in your bay, which would later weave their way from your port of Calcutta to the city of Dundee, on my banks, which in its heyday was a first rank, and could boast and give a toast for being the hub of the gunny bag club, its thriving industry. But that was not till the 1830s when my crops fed your factories and Dundee led the world trade processing fabrics from my raw jute. Dull brown sheets matted from the rubric of golden yarn. A success story spun out in Cinderella splendor. The near 40,000 hundredweight of my billowing bales soared to dizzy heights of 13 million, which rose to more in 1904, multiplying your sales beyond speculation or expectation as goods from my lands reached your production arcades and the rocketing tons linked our strands by this golden skein. Those massive bales of 400 pounds compressed by your hydraulic power, were processed by cylinders and teeth into golden slivers on my shores, and later in yours, toned finer and finer with fastidious combs and twisted into robes, was just like our distributaries roam into diverse streams, the warps with the hard twist are swirled in spools for dressing and starching, and reeled in hanks, made ready for bleached futures and coloured dreams of factory looms. Active in your shores, and the wefts with the soft twist were put in neat cots and thrust into bags for weaving to follow in time. So there was I, watching your trade gather momentum, while I stayed, biding my time, waiting for the time to turn. And it did, with the war, when our jute had lost its place as the golden-haired beauty desired by the markets of the West. The boom of the pre-war years tied through skein and veil to a world economy affected its market value as the cost of production met reduction when the course of the journey of jute faced curtailment with the war raging along the jute route. This tall lass then had to look to homegrown devices. So it was processed more and more on the shores where it grew this tall, proud crop thriving the damp now bowed in defeat in the worldwide slump of the demand for jute. When prices fell and the raw jute lost favour, I have heard it plummeted the peasant of East Bengal to despair, and the harvesting proper in an oversight of planters was transformed overnight to a mendicant with no borrowing power. True. His one-time rice-sustaining land had been turned to the drenching might of hemp and strand of fibrous jute. Crops which now stood like towers of impending doom without the quenching promise of food. As famine hit my lower course. Where bumper crops of rice stood, they were felled, swiftly, deftly reaped, and stowed in stores. While millions wept, and millions walked, and millions groaned and died unmourned 
hunger and fatigue on my fertile shores. I have not witnessed famine like you, but I have seen my sons who knew the sparseness of the highlands leave their home to seek abroad the wealth their lands could not afford. seeking sustenance elsewhere, and some came to stay by your side, where they upturned paddy fields for new yields of cash crops drained by your tide, stretching from your bay across the waterways, reaching your multiple streams, and following your length upwards along the plains of your alluvial terrain. So the network of industries was assiduously woven steadily enmeshing your shores with mine, and the golden yarn still holds with time. Dundee's factory wheels and college for years have had Bengal's youth as engineers binding technology with ecology on your course and mine. Yes, their hopes soared like rockets freed. But the great change that history decreed was something no one had foreseen. It came with partition in a relentless stream that ruptured all vision of a continuous dream. A line was drawn on the mind map of men, though my waters refused to be divided by them. They created fresh problems with the jute in one land and the factories all lined along another strand. A curious border severing the crop from the machines that were needed to process them for the shops. Well, here beyond my docks you will still find people who once flocked to Dundee. When it ruled the jute trade in its heyday they decided to stay. Though the world turned away from its flax and mainstay, men unsure of their next step. I have heard there's a photograph of sahibs in suits, all graduates of Dundee, in a reunion banquet. And if you look closely at the black and white shot, you'll see they are all Indians. A right jovial lot. But what did they do when the wheels stopped dead with long years of uncertainty ahead? Right along my course and along diverse banks of rivers, sea coasts where people have settled, hospitality trade finds expression in the finest cuisine brought from your banks to mine. And take it as you may, our Indian restaurants today are manned and run by men who came, escaping your sun and monsoon rains. They're mostly from what is Bangladesh now, where you are the Padma, and a changeling of amazing identities. These men from your bay dominate our palate today as chicken tikka masala and creamy karma become national dishes of a land from which the spice wars began. So the spice route has turned the full circle with Patak and Raj commemorating the pinnacle of easy access to culinary success and other links fostered. For it just takes one man with vision and synergy to break man-made dams. Patrick Gibbs 
Tywin Blanner from Balator, invited to design and restore towns in your shore, which relied on your tide and have survived with pride. I know this man with his penetrating eyes, his straggling beard and leonine mane that staunchly denied coercive means of brush or comb. I heard his footsteps echo and roam right down to Dwasashamit Gat when he touched my holy water and imprinted my loam on an historic visit to my ancient city. The powers that ruled thought Kashi too old to be preserved with its temples and palaces, its domes and its mansions, its almhouses and rest houses, its alleyways and byways that swerved through markets and sidled down to gaps built for bathing or burning. A motley crowd of buildings that have perched for centuries with my mandate against the furies of time and fate. This curious blend marks my land, emblematic of civilization itself, a variety seen in its entirety along my journey. Recognizing the existence of the rich and the needy, the grand and the seedy, side by side, and allowed to bide with tolerance, with an old acceptance. And Geddes saw the beauty of Varanasi as it was, and decreed it be untouched by the bulldozer's unmitigating crush. So, we owe Varanasi's presence to get his essence of diagnostic surgery and restorative sex. <clears throat> Geddes. Geddes grew up in Perth, which perches on my shoreline, moving south after birth in Balater, that lovely spot far from my water, ruled by the Dee, which flows with easy certainty to embrace the icy folds of the North Sea. There the bairn was born, watched by old oaks in Craig and Dad. Before he moved on, when his father whisked him away to come and stay in his gardened world, on my threshold, a Perth, not far from my birthplace. And where would you say you really begin? Near Dochet? Or Lochie? Or is a Loch the place of your birth? Nay, I would say I have an undeclared course. Before they call me the Tay, Loch Tay lies at the source of my naming ceremony. I'll take you in a flashback in a retreating dream of a back flowing stream on a reverse track. Before Loch Tay, I'm the Dochert, racing over rapids from the Loch of the same name, through which I come gushing onwards. Beyond the falls of Dochert's home, I roam as the Philip, carrying on from Cornish, that river which owes its flow to the bounty of Ult and Lut, as it tumbles forth with energy. Its birth pangs witnessed with ecstasy from the proud point of Ben Lloyd, the peak, from where I spring in a tumultuous leap to journey down a Scotland's longest river, a picturesque line sliding through this high terrain. It is at Rishikesh, that sacred place where Holy men meditate and wait for benediction that I leap from my Himalayan heights to sweep under a precarious bridge, swinging like Lakshman's temper, a gossamer splendor that spans my purest freshness, where saints gather while I begin my epic journey down the plains that know no end. I had my bridges too, which were built to conquer floods that ferries met, which swept the markets and pavements of streets that wept when my waves leapt to scatter inhabitants. 
The floods of 1621 washed away the bridge that spanned my course of peril. People had to use the ferry to sail and carry men and goods. Till 1771, when another bridge began this discourse in stone that now punctuates my concourse, meeting the fleet of roads running parallel to the original high street, like your Rishikesh, where sages dwell, I love my tongue geld, where the saints' relics were held, initially called Kaldin, and home to a hermit settlement. Soon the devout lost interest when St. Andrews won the relics of their patron Columba, to whom they prayed for protection. But frequent floods continued to deter Scottish engineers from providing affording means till 1789, for which time Dunkeld became the Highland Market on Fridays. It's the place where salmon swam. Under Capeth's bridge span, and the fish can still float past the cathedral, which has reclaimed Dunkel's touristic fame its historic walls enveloped by leafy banks, conscious of my easy stroll. And at Perth, you'll see marvellous expansions of bridge on bridge like multiple stone visions that are my epics in architecture which defeat the imagination that once knew the floods my waters could renew without compunction or retreat, the havoc they could repeat through the years of loss of life and property were countered by constructions that wiped away recurrent fears and the memory of uncertain times and tears. I do know your Scottish engineers, as they brought their spanners and suspensions, their cantilevers and extensions right across my expanse, in places where I, like the sea, stretched on to eternity. And only a bridge, once erected like a rainbow on sites selected to define my boundaries, made it possible to imagine my distant shore. But nothing could really confine my wayward flow. Mine is a riverine valley, fordable technically, but my backs have crumbled through time as my waves roll in serpentine alternate rhythm, defying control. Embankments and dams stagger my progress with old cities and new industries, timeless paddy and new sprung jute, which sit side by side along my route. And as I leave Patna, that bastion of old civilization and novel corruption, I went south to assume a sluggish abandon, branching out as I reach my mouth into numerous streams of brackish water in the region of the Mahona. Is this where the legion city of Calcutta grew, born of three villages that Joel Charnet drew together to cradle the trade of competing commerce? Calcutta stands above the bay on one of my many diversions, the Hooghly. And along its strand, you can see mansions alongside palaces and cute bungalows which meditate on this young city's cosmopolitan reality, which was once the second city of empire. It is known Renaissance and Revolution through a checkered history and now assumes a new identity as the cultural capital of a free country where the old city and new have grown to encompass and subsume a hinterland of industry and suburbs.
till it has become the home to 14 million who are proud of its welcoming intimacy. My Scottish engineers once relaxed in your Duke bungalows after a day's heavy round of supervising the machines that churned the returns on the dusty weekly which lacked my men Sahib's world between fearfuls and flurries and tennis parties before the sun went down in a way of life to which your city owes its birth. The old and new sit comfortably on my banks too. Looking west from Dundee, you can spot Newborough Town, this 18th century high street leading to the tidal mystery of a once busy quay with old fishing boats encapsulating its past history, now embodied in a sculpture of a bronze salmon on a site where once stood a buzzing factory of imperial activity, producing linoleum, floor, cloth, bound to the jute grown in your home ground. Today a park and new housing spill over and fill the place that once supplied 700 jobs, over a hundred years till as late as 19. 78. I meet my present and my past at Priyad, that holy rag of harmony, my Trevaini, where my living sister Jamuna spills her arms of loving pearls, and we remember one lost stream, a sister who survives in dreams the Saraswati, who still runs in the portals of Earth's wombs. And it is here that Motella saw his son grow up to spurn a life under a foreign yoke, that he with Gandhi strove to break and revoke the dignity of living free beside my abiding tide. I too have known the tedium of being confined by a union that blurred the reality of individuality for my nation, subsumed by the history of a debated quartet, and allowed to resume its identity as the land of Adam Smith and David Hume in a peaceful revolution of devolution. I have known revolution of another kind in a land reform movement, igniting young minds with the spark of bringing improvement through annihilation of old institutions. It was quenched by brute force, but it still has not lost its voice, though driven underground, smouldering in villages that I sustain as folks fight back in a final struggle for prime land for which they see no substitution in spite of industrialization. This struggle with the government began two decades after your people had transferred power to mine, and the memory of empire had become a faded reality as new wars invaded my weeping embankments. But looking back, when my men and women mingled with yours through years of imperial association. Those centuries have not been without gain for my men who filled the corn chest of Scotland with grain and yarn, gleaned and grown in your hot land. They came back with memories and longings, nurtured and nourished in times made irrelevant by war's devastation as a generation was left to pick up the pieces so the returned expatriates could only cherish and ruminate on a life they had known in the private chambers of their minds and home. I know this agony of longing for some of your countrymen remained on my shore, the only one they knew, made familiar and true through custom and time where they had spent their prime and would continue to drink their whiskey sodas as dusk enveloped their verandas. But the old life was gone 
and a new constitution brought fresh dreams of a nation eager to see fiefdoms and kingdoms, plantations and palaces become chapters of an old book of imperial history. For democracy demanded a new resolution of albeit a truncated entity in the identity of two nations fulfilling a pledge with destiny, recovering though not in full measure but very substantially in a trace with time, which cut up their land and their people in a wrench that tore minds but could not succeed in ripping my waters or carving boundaries on my fluid freedom. So they continue to debate about ownership and demarcation, the possibility of amalgamation as remote as the Himalayan peaks of my initiation route. So I enfold their seed and I feed their multiplying breed and from time to time I drown them in seasonal spate that has its beginnings on the very brink of my banks. Yes, men have not discovered that the earth creates her own natural borders, which they cannot decide, even when they call for boundaries along ethnic divides which spill over courses that we will continue to run as nature decrees, not men. There will always be the old life, folded in the new, it is for me and you to nurture what we value within our banks and close our ranks to protect and save the treasures of our ways. And what can we do when another revolution alters our Riviera beyond recognition? Tourists today may take a launch and glide down my branch on the Hughley by day and the city of palaces with edifices of grandeur will unravel in a sprawl that will enthrall the viewer. And what can be newer than the fresh development that overpowers and denies a whole age of achievement against the jute manager's bungalows standing in mute testimony to old times as old mills stay silent on reflective embankment. But unlike men, whose riches know rise and fall with time's flow, we have our riches, which we hold in our folds as we ride high or subside, treasures that we cherish. Unlike they who destroy what we have today for instant gain without thought of tomorrow's pain, so in my ever-flowing stream, I have always harbored dreams that I will now share with you. From Perth to Dunkel, I have borne and proudly held shoals of salmon who have swum against my current and ultimately won a strenuous race, claiming their territory finally from me, journeying upstream from the dark pools where they lay waiting. There, the anglers came by day to drop their lines and catch their prey, which in time dwindled drastically to their dismay and that of Gourmet, who today find the salmon of the wild replaced by the child of hatcheries in farms. For my tributaries are seeded now with the view to multiply the few, ensuring huge runs of fish up the almond to the lower beaks. In March, the middle beats in May, reaching the upper beats in mild July days. Noticeable numbers swim to Eret, but there's no direct gain for me, as they say, the tay, the last gasping foothold for the stragglers who find their way to my headwaters, at the end of the day repeating an old journey, but having lost the adventurous boldness of the past, the pleasure of being born in the wilderness when nature reigned before nurture drained the will to be free in utmost liberty from poaching distress. 
You call your salmon the gourmet fish. I too have one to match your favorite dish. It too is an estuary fish, the silver hilsa, which swims close to the bay. And when the monsoons come, it makes its way upstream to spawn along my distributaries, the Rupnarayan, the Bagarati, the Hoogli, and in my surging sister, the turbulent Padma. But now the Hilsa is facing disaster as greedy fishing jeopardizes my stock of this merchandise. Such disasters I've known when Russian ships netted my free waters for the sand eels that my salmon feed on. And well-meaning friends of the environment have saved the seals that make a meal of my salmon. The gourmet fish that's sure to diminish at the Scots are now not canny enough to devise means to replenish the shoals and cherish and protect the numbers that still fill my stream which has been their ancient home. In the Deltaic Bengal, where I drift into multiple identities and a mesh of waterways that know swift changeability and flash floods upstream which then affect my layout on a whim, where I am not what I seem, flowing at ease, apparently mellowed in my twilight course, but finding the old individualism and spark on the turbulent diversion of the Padma, the intractable, unpredictable, surging or calm, destructive or creative, her vibrant depths, the ultimate home of the proverbial delicacy, the seasonal Hilsa of Bengal. And is your Hilsa still at home and teeming in your generous stream? Heavy trawling in the open sea of diverse shoals has put pressure on the salmon stops in me. My fishermen fish in small boats as trawlers are beyond their means. But I have another curse. The industries along my banks and all the cities who belong to my courts spew their fumes, their filth and waste that through the years have consumed my strength and goodness and I can trace the threatening line that brings decline to the Hilsa race. The pollution makes them gasp for breath in my depths as fish grow still under the weight of the mill of modernity's will and fear of death. name and fame. In this day, you can't be serious and sage when you say that your ways are held as sacred today. In this country, a river's history has spiritual grace. It is born in heaven and carries divine force in its wayward course. And none is more sacred than my flowing water and every drop of it is blessed matter for the believer. To drink from me is to be cleansed from sin and fury. Drops from me bring true shanty on heads bowed in worship and piety to my deity. All along my length, 
People waiting at dawn and sunset to feel my strength and see the dark fade and pray for the light to return at my side. Lamps are floated with flames that quiver up and down the length of my river and petals are scattered for my intervention with the mighty Shiva. It's a different world here where the spiritual stays clear amidst the reality that is bracing and brawl and myths seem remote as my waters promote all the sports of racing that draw the sportsmen and Scotsmen as this river offers challenges of braving the blast and the Scots who once held the most of shipping and trading and I find expression in skimming my surge with adventurous urge so my white water rapids have a heady delight of rafters and canoeists watched from heights of the hills that contemplate my course. The excitement of movement on the splurge of my waves is far from what your countrymen meditate as they watch your force. The clock has turned in a fresh resolution as paragliding and yachting, kayaking and canoeing provide the adventure that once drew men to venture across the ocean. But they do return, as English binds the globalised, and they come to join a new network, not of rivers, but of the web, which weaves them into the folds of my old cities, where India's young dare to dream of a universe speaking across time and space, as one half sleeps and another awakes aware of the divisions of a weapon-building world of political suspicion. I think we stand on the brink of disaster that spells danger for our future. If trident missiles are guarded and improved, not destroyed or removed, for they will annihilate the human race from the face of this planet. Our defense is our resilience. An ability to accept change and learn to move on as we range through old roots, embracing the possibilities of newfound diversity. Yours is a culture my people saw, looking for spiritualism when smothered by the materialism they bought so easily in lands where the sun set and families felt fractured by the tide of individualism. We seem to have turned from that symbol of equanimity we once offered enveloped now in a climate of nurtured hate and anticipated enmity. For my country went delirious some years ago when it had exploded fission bombs to set alight a chain reaction in neighbouring Pakistan. And then with Afghanistan becoming a place for bombing revelry and with one death in five of every Iraqi alive. My people feel smugly safe from invasion and occupation. Yet what they fail to comprehend is that storing nuclear heads can only guarantee more dead, created on the foundation of suspicion and dread. You and I can only do what we do best. That is to flow with the certainty of continuity. Letting our water's sacred truth seep into human consciousness as the source of life, like light and trees, the earth and breeze. Our rhythms spelling, spelling harmony, which if nurtured can guarantee Shanti, Shanti, Shanti for eternity.